If you were to arrive at Coney Island's dreamland via one of its fleet of steamships, which, I mean, that's how I'd do it, one of the first things you'd notice just beyond the double-leveled pier and its massive French Renaissance-style ballroom would be the Chute de Chutes, a double ramp of wood and steel that arched over the ocean itself. And I ask you, is there a more early days of Coney Island sounding name than Shoot the Chutes? Just saying it makes me want to put on a straw boater and dance the bunny hug. And yet, despite the early 1900s name and a general lack of fanfare, Shoot the Chutes rides have survived into the present day right alongside their older brother, the roller coaster, but without reaching the same dizzying heights or the thrilling twists and turns. So let's take a moment to look at the history of this often forgotten ride, this workhorse of amusement parks the world over. Before we get into all that though, do me a favor and click the like button down below and maybe even subscribe. It does help me out a lot. So when Dreamland first opened in 1904, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that the park would feature one of these water rides. After all, Dreamland's bread and butter was ripping off the nearby Luna Park, and Luna had one of the very first shoot the shoots. But despite the PR of a man who called himself the fearless frogman, it was not actually the first. Okay, so let's back up. And don't worry, we'll be coming back to the Fearless Frogman, but first we need to head over to Rock Island, Illinois. It was there in 1882 that Rock Island Mayor Bailey Davenport opened an amusement park called Black Hawk's Watchtower. And in 1887, ride designer J.P. Newberg modified a wooden toboggan slide to run in the summer, changing the wintertime sleds to boats that would slide down 250 feet of greased wooden track at speeds reported to be up to 80 miles per hour before they reached the bottom and skittered out onto the surface of the nearby Rock River. Once it slowed down enough in the water, each boat had a skipper in the back who would paddle it to shore where riders would exit and the park staff would have to haul the boat back up to the top of the slide where it would stop and turn and go for another ride. Poor guys. The ride was extremely popular and J.P. Newberg patented it in 1889. And this is where the Fearless Frogman comes in. Shockingly, Fearless Frogman was not his given name. It was actually Paul Boyton. And he was just as fascinating a person as that incredible pseudonym he gave himself would suggest. Born in 1848, he quickly showed an intense love of the water and swimming, which first translated into him joining the Union Navy during the Civil War. Then, oh boy. Let's see. He joined the Mexican Navy, fought for the French in the Franco-Prussian War, was made a captain in the Peruvian Navy, escaped from the Chilean Navy, returned to the United States where he helped to organize the United States Life Saving Service, a precursor to the Coast Guard, invented an inflatable rubber suit which he floated across the English Channel, paddled 430 miles along the Rhine, navigated all important rivers on the North American continent, floated 2,000 miles from Oil City, Pennsylvania to the Gulf of Mexico, spurred a worldwide interest in open water swimming, opened a bar in New York City where he apparently egged on the first man to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge, who died, by the way, which Boyton was blamed for, formed an aquatic circus, and after noting the popularity of the Midway at the World's Columbian Exhibition, purchased a half-interest in Newberg's Shoot the Shoots patent, and then opened the first permanent amusement park in Chicago, which he called Boyton's Water Shoots, then built the very first amusement park on Coney Island, called Sea Lion Park, which featured trained sea lions, and you guessed it, shoot the shoots. And the fearless frogman who definitely knew how to market himself began billing this shoot the shoots as the first one in the world. To be fair, it was Boynton who built and popularized the ride across, well, the world, including London, Antwerp, San Francisco. That's what Haight-Ashbury was known for before it became known for um, other things. And uh, damn near everywhere, it seems. 
Not only did Boynton popularize the ride, but he also improved it, notably by automating the process whereby the boat was brought back to the top of the slide. Now, after the boat had skittered across the water, the skipper would still guide it to the bottom of the slide and let the riders off, but now he could hook the boat to a cable attached to a turntable that would wind up the cable and bring the boat back up to the top. Boynton never fully realized the profit potential of Sea Lion Park. Honestly, he probably just got itchy feet and wanted to go float down Niagara Falls or something like that. And when the 1902 season turned rainy and miserable, he sold its land to Fred Thompson and Skip Dundee, who renamed it Luna Park, getting rid of the sea lions but keeping the Shoot the Shoots, which had already become an iconic part of Coney Island's mystique. In order to attract publicity, the Luna Park impresarios sent a number of elephants down the Shoot the Shoots. And whatever Luna Park had, Dreamland also had to have, but bigger and better. So of course, when Dreamland opened in 1904, it boasted the largest Shoot the Shoots ever built to that point with a 280 foot long slide, a moving staircase, and double ramps which allowed the ride to serve up to 7,000 people per hour. In its opening season, no less a personage than New York Governor Odell rode the attraction, apparently whooping like a schoolboy. According to the Evening World, Governor Odell occupied the front seat with Taggart and the boat was pushed off. The party whooped like a parcel of schoolboys as the boat flew down the steep incline. Governor Odell braced himself with feet well forward and took a long breath as he prepared for the final plunge into the water. The spray lifted 20 feet into the air as the boat struck the water and a generous shower fell upon the men in the boat. The governor's straw hat got a wetting, but he simply smiled. That's better than a cocktail, said one of the party, and the governor said he guessed it was, although he wasn't a judge. Of course, the Dreamland shoots burned with the rest of the park in 1911. The Luna Park shoots fared better. They lasted until 1944 when they, um, well, they burned down with the rest of the park. And, uh, and this is why people back then thought that asbestos was such a great idea, even though it was linked to cancer as early as the 1930s. And they were just sick of everything burning down all the time. As of today, Shoot the Shoots as a class are alive and well, and honestly, unlike roller coasters, they haven't changed all that much in the intervening years. Mainly, they just got taller, and they got rid of the open lagoon at the bottom. Now the boats remain on a track, which meant that they could also get rid of the skipper in the back of the boat, which, honestly, I consider a real shame, because... Who wouldn't want a skipper in an amusement park ride with them? If you're less interested in the truly dizzying modern examples of Shoot the Shoots and would rather check out something closer to a truly old school ride, there are still a few choices in the world. The Pittsburgh Plunge at Kennywood in West Mifflin, Pennsylvania is an attempt to replicate the lost magic of those original shoots. Whether it does or not, I can't say, but it probably does a better job than the Garfield's Nightmare Ride replicated the original Old Mill at the same park. But if you want the real deal, you just aren't going to get any closer than the boat shoot at Lake Winnipa... Winnipesuka... Winnipesuk? Lake Winnie, Georgia. Built in 1926, the boat shoot is the oldest shoot the shoots in the United States and offers an authentic experience very close to what amusement park patrons would have experienced over 100 years ago without the skipper, unfortunately. Thanks for watching today, and if you haven't already, hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you'd like to offer more support for this fledgling channel, head over to patreon.com slash Bannerman, where you can sign up to donate as little as $1 a month to help this channel get going. And you can pick up some cool perks, including vlogs, supplemental information, and even voting rights to help decide the focus of future episodes. Until next time, thank you for meeting me in Dreamland.